there we go. Wonderful. Thanks. Right. Well, um, welcome everyone to uh, this um, final episode of the UK Anthology series. Um, uh, my name is Jamie and uh, I'm um, a uh, biology student and a uh, member of REPEAT and we're really excited um, to uh, present this uh, final episode with you all tonight. Um, so the uh, we'll, we'll be first um, hearing from a video uh, that we made um sorry that we that we have made um here at repeat um and i won't say anything more about that um because it'll be an exciting premiere for you all <laughs> um, and then we're going to hear from uh, kate carver from the uh great ben project um and finally we'll hear from uh robert cordwell from uh the lowland peat agricultural task force so peatlands and agriculture. So at repeat, we often talk about uh, the peatland paradigm shift and we apply this framework to a range of deeper issues. Um, but agriculture is really an area where the idea of a paradigm shift is quite particularly stark, I think. Um, also similarly to how we think uh, of peatlands intersecting with a whole range of wider issues um, at repeat. Agriculture is just one part of the food system, which is complex and really extends into every aspect of our lives. So thinking through agriculture and the food system, we quite quickly get into the realm of um, quite broad scale um, societal change, and which is an exciting place to be um, for a, a, a discussion. So through the second half of the 20th, 20th century, the agricultural paradigm was to increase production and, and decrease the cost of food. The subsidies and policies and cultural attitudes all fed into this. Uh, and there's now a better recognition of the need to produce nutritious food sustainably and fairly too. And there's some encouraging movements pushing for this, such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas. But going back even further to the beginning of agriculture, we see a deeper set paradigm, um, and that is farming on dry land. Um, and more than that, by farming crops that prefer dry ecosystems, and therefore moulding ecosystems to fit these crops, i.e. draining the land. We now know that draining peatlands agriculture releases huge amounts of greenhouse gases and degrades a valuable ecosystem. But in many areas all over the world, including oil palm plantations in Southeast Asia, uh, but also in East Anglia here in the UK, the livelihoods of local people depends on agriculture being done on drained peatlands. And we can't simply remove these people from the equation and restore the peatland. This is fundamentally ineffective, it's unjust, and it repeats the colonial practices that have caused so much destruction of peatlands. And that's why developing methods of farming that can be done on wet peatlands is so crucial for a sustainable, just future for peatlands. And so I think this topic of agriculture and peatlands is so, um, so, so deep set, really, I think, and is such an interesting topic of conversation uh, from this quite like fundamental point of view of how we produce um, food from the land, um, as well as um, having very, um, very immediate, relevant um, policy um, applications in the here and now. Um, and so that's why I'm really excited to uh, kind of host this webinar and um, learn more about this. Um, and and I'd be remiss as well as to say, like as as a, as a biologist and a scientist, like that the science behind it is also really really interesting. And actually, developing these these techniques um, which achieve these goals um, that we've set out, which is managing these peatlands sustainably. Um, and mitigating these emissions, you know, how is that best done? What are the best practices to do that? It's really such a new um, field in, in, in many of these locations that these questions are all kind of still quite um, active areas of, uh, of investigation. So yeah, so I'm excited about this and, um, and I'll shut up now. And uh, without further ado, um, 
pass on to uh, Bethany, who's going to um, play uh, the video that um, we uh, have prepared for this month's uh, episode. Polluted culture is the productive land use of wet and re-wetted peatland that preserves the peat soil and thereby minimizes Sorry, I'm just going to check that everybody is on mute just before I go again. Okay, cool. Sorry, guys. You can uh, put comments in the chat just while we play the video, just so that the audio is a little bit clear. Let's try again. Polluted culture is the productive land use of wet and re-wetted peatlands that preserves the peat soil and thereby minimises CO2 emissions and subsidence. Here are 10 polluted culture plants that you need to know. Alder. Alder trees form a symbiotic relationship with a nitrogen fixing bacteria. Their wood can be used for all sorts of carpentry applications. Bog myrtle. Another amazing nitrogen fixing plant that's a natural insect repellent and can be used to flavour beer. Sedges. There are loads of species of sedge that specialise the peatlands. Although we might not eat them, they can be a good source of fodder for cattle. Water mint. Mint can be cultivated on peatlands for use in tea. Its flowers are also great for a range of pollinators. Reed. Common reed was traditionally used for thatching roofs. You can also compress reed into insulation blocks. In China, there's a high demand for reed to make paper. Cattail. Cattail, also known as bulrush, has those of big air spaces in its stems, which help it transport oxygen. These air spaces make it great as a material for insulation bricks. Wild rice. Wild rice is similar to the domesticated variety that most of us know. It's been a vital food plant for First Nations and Indigenous people in North America for thousands of years, for whom it's also of great cultural and historical importance. In the UK, wild rice is being trialled for cultivation on peatlands. Cranberry. Whether you like your cranberries juiced, dried, covered in chocolate or with a splash of vodka, we need boggy conditions to grow them in. Sundew. The carnivorous sundew is one of our favourite peat plants, with its bright alien tentacles and delicate white flowers hovering above. Well, it also contains several pharmaceutically important compounds. These compounds have anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties and help treat coughs. And last but not least, sphagnum, aka peat moss. Sphagnum isn't edible itself, but rather you can grow edible plants in sphagnum. Basically, instead of using peat to grow fruit and veg in greenhouses, you use the plant that peat is made of. Growing sphagnum for compost means farmers can earn money from re-wet peatlands and at the same time, divert demand from peat mining. Thanks so much. Um, uh, yeah, the, the sound was working okay for, for me, so I hope um, um, at least mo most people managed to hear that okay. And um, if you didn't, um, we'll be posting it on our uh, YouTube channel um, after the webinar. Um, and um, yeah, and thanks Frankie for those uh, beautiful illustrations um, and voiceover it was brilliant. Um, okay, now we're going to hear from uh, Kate Carver, who has um, a recorded um, presentation uh, to share with us. Um, so uh, Kate uh, is the uh, Great Fen project manager. Um, Kate joined in 2020, um, uh, delivering the project partners vision. Uh, and previously following a long career in the heritage sector, um, so she worked for the National Trust, uh, managing cultural landscape and environmental heritage in East Anglia. 
Um, and the Great Fen project is a huge peatland restoration project taking place in Cambridgeshire, which is a really large area of lowland peatlands, uh, the majority of which have been drained uh, for agriculture. Uh, and polluted culture trials are a key part of the uh, restoration strategy for the Great Fen project. Um, and um, yeah, can't wait to, to hear more about that. Good evening, my name is Kate Carver and I'm the Great Fen Project Manager working for the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire. I'm going to be talking about the Great Fen. The Great Fen is situated in Cambridgeshire with Peterborough to the north and Huntingdon to the south. If you look at the map on the left with a little red spot there, right on the western edge of the East Anglian Fenland Basin. This is a vast wetland, um, a wetland ecology which has been largely lost since 1600 due to drainage for agriculture. And the situation about 20 years ago was, as we see it on the right hand side, so two remnants of that original Fenland ecology concentrated into two national nature reserves, Home Fen at the top and Wood Walton Fen at the bottom, separated by intensively drained, intensively farmed arable land, with a resultant loss of Fenland species, such as the large copper butterfly, last recorded at Wood Walton Fen in the 1850s. So the solution to this was to create the Great Fen, which was the UK's first living landscape, conservation on a landscape scale. We have a long term vision to create a vast new wetland. At its greatest extent, it will be 3,700 hectares, a fantastic wetland for wildlife and for people to enjoy in the fens. To date, we own half our vision area and we have 1,700 hectares under conservation management, of which 1,200 hectares is arable reversion, now transitioning to wetland. How we're doing it, it's being delivered through a project partnership comprising the Environment Agency, Huntingdonshire District Council, the Middle Level Commission, who look after the drainage and flood attenuation in this part of the Fens, Natural England and the Wildlife Trust. And really this photograph sums, sums it up. Um, this was a Google Earth satellite flying over from north at the top of the photograph to south. And um, it got halfway through its uh, flight and then gave up for the day. And so the bottom half shows the landscape as it was and the top half shows how the landscape looks after we've begun our wetland reversion. And for me, this is the great excitement of the Great Fen. We are pioneers. We're literally changing the face of the earth in our part of the Fens. And having created the wetland, having begun to create that matrix of different wetland habitat, habitats, the wildlife moves in. And we know that through our extensive monitoring programme. So previously, uh, when I spoke about the wildlife on the Great Fen, I used to show an artist's impression of Eurasian great cranes, but now I don't need to because we've got the real thing, as you can see from the picture at the bottom here. And that's just another inspiring shot of the shining waters of some of the restored land um, you saw in that satellite picture. So that's an area called Kester's Docking. Everything we do is based on science. Uh, some years back we had um, uh, eco-hydrological modelling done of the Great Fen. So essentially this looked at the water resource available from all sources, from precipitation, groundwater, um, etc. And um, looked at the topography and worked out which communities, which plant communities could be created where according to the availability of water. So at the top of the map in the north, that's the lowest lying areas of the Great Fen. The land rises as you come down to the south. So theoretically, given the water 
and given the ability to control it, we should be able to create the wettest habitats in the north, such as reed bed, open water, wet grassland, fen meadow, and then moving south, the drier habitats as well. So essentially we're working with topography, water and soils. And the soils in question are essentially peat. Um, here in the Great Fen we still have some areas of deep peat. The map on the left shows the peat depths. Um, the darker the colour, the greater the depths of peat. This was from a survey done in the 1980s. Uh, the data did not cover the whole of the Great Fen. And actually, we're now in the process of um, revisiting this. We have Cranfield University working for us, looking at the extent of the peat, the depth, the carbon content, and importantly, the amount of peat wastage. I mentioned the Great Fen Project Partnership and how we're delivering the project. And we do have a plan, the Great Fen Master Plan, which you can download from our website which sets out four aims for the project. Creating that wetland habitat is one of our aims. And another of our aims is to plan, design and manage the Great Fen to benefit climate change adaptation and mitigation. And we do that in three main ways. So firstly, through creating that connectivity so that uh, terrestrial species have corridors of movement to move between our new habitats. We know that with climate change, species are altering their geographical range, such as this willow emerald damselfly. Um, but for the terrestrial species, we need to create corridors of movement. As you can see from the map, we're beginning to get that connectivity in the north of our project. And when I talk later on about our peatland progress project, you'll be able to see how we're also achieving it in the south. So we get connectivity all the way through. The second way in which we can help with climate change is through flood attenuation, through providing, um, well really through making the landscape more resilient to absorbing excess water. At the moment Woodwalton Fen is used as an emergency flood water storage area for the middle level. When they have too much water in the system, uh, water is allowed into Woodwalton Fen. And that can happen at any time of the year. It's particularly damaging in the summer if there are nesting birds. And one of the aims of the Great Fen is to find alternative water storage areas within a landscape that can absorb that additional capacity. And then the third way in which we're helping with climate change is through carbon, really preventing um, the release of carbon dioxide. As you know, when peat dries out, it oxidises, peat is physically lost, it blows away, and more importantly, perhaps it emits carbon dioxide. So that brings me to our waterworks project. This is a picture of a fen blow. So this is where the top few centimetres of peat have dried. They've become very dry, very friable. Um, they're releasing carbon dioxide, they're blowing away and we get these black fogs in the, in, the, in the fens. A lot of peat is lost each year in the fens. Uh, not only that, but it pollutes the watercourses and of course it emits carbon dioxide. Um, we're not the only ones who are concerned about this problem. Um, farmers and the NFU are very concerned as well. They have a goal of achieving net zero by 2040. So working together, we need to find solutions to these problems. And one of the solutions that we've been pursuing is our waterworks project. In 2019, we were able to um, win funding from the People's Postcode Lottery for our project waterworks which is all about developing more sustainable systems. There are two elements of it to develop a more sustainable farming system, trialing crops, trialing crops that grow in wet conditions, wet farming, and also transforming how people work together for sustainable development in the fens by achieving a UNESCO biosphere designation for the fens. We have project partners to help us deliver all this, Cambridgeshire Acre, who are working on the biosphere aspect. And on the wet farming, we have UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, 
world leaders in climate change science and University of East London who are experts in wet farming, also known as polluted culture, the methodology and the crops. And the link between the two elements of our project, the wet farming and the biosphere, is the peat because the peat largely defines the extent of a future biosphere designation. We're all facing the same problems in the fens, how we sustain both agriculture and the natural environment, how we manage the water resources, how we protect the peat soils, how we allow for um, development and support rural and urban livelihoods, and how we tackle climate change. Our project looks at all of these things. So what are we doing exactly? Um, we know that wet farming can help build up, build soils, prevent the loss of peat. We know it can clean water. We know it can lock in carbon dioxide. And what we're doing is conducting for the first time in the UK, field scale trials of wet farming polluted cultural crops that have applications for food, industry and biomedical uses. And um, we're doing this in real life conditions in a, in a fen farm within the Great Fen. So previously there's been small scale uh, academic trials of pluticultural crops, but we're doing it in a farm setting on a larger scale. So this is our wet farming site. Um, it's a five hectare site within the northern part of the Great Fen. Uh, and it si consists of a series of 10 polluted cultural beds, which are surrounded by a, a bund, a raised bank. So the top 15 centimetres or so of peat was taken off the surface, which was levelled. Um, a deep trench was dug all around the site. The peat that was taken off was then compacted into the trench to create an impermeable bund. There's a bund between each bed, so they're all separate but they're all linked by a system of pipes which moves water through the site from the north in the top to the south at the bottom, feeding the pluticultural crops as we go. And the crops themselves help to clean water so that we have um, the crops that require the cleanest water at the bottom. So starting at the top, we have two beds of reed mace, uh, typha, we have two beds of reed, um, Phragmites australis. We have a bed of Glyceria fluitans, which is a cereal crop, which we're trialling. So for the first time on a field scale in the UK. We have two beds of what we're calling our novel crops. So these are fenland species, which have applications for food, flavouring, biomedical use. And at the bottom, we have three beds of our sphagnum. We also have a water storage reservoir. So this was the site um, upon largely, we'd largely finished completion of the infrastructure works back in July. As you can imagine, COVID has been a massive disrupting factor. Uh, but by 2020, we were wetting up the site. So charging the system, bringing the water into the top bed, which then runs through these connecting pipes down through all the other beds. I'm feeling very jolly about it, as you can see from the picture in the centre of my colleague Mark. And then we started planting. Um, yes, we're doing it all by hand, which is not how a fen farmer would do it. We know that. Uh, but for us, this, is an, this helps us with another aspect of the project, which is com community engagement and giving people an opportunity to take positive physical action against climate change. So we're doing the planting with a lot of volunteer help, volunteer groups, staff groups, um, including some notable planters such as Tony Juniper here at the bottom on the right. And by November 2020, we'd got six and a half beds out of our 10 planted. So about three hectares planted by hand, which was about 50,000 plants. And the sphagnum planting is to follow. We have 150,000 sphagnum propagules to put in between this autumn and next spring. And yeah, that's it. The sphagnum is now going in. Um, 
We are using um, the services of a company called Micro Propagation Services Limited who have propagated the sphagnum for us. Uh, this particular sphagnum is coming in the form of little hummocks with individual strands which are then very carefully placed into the peat. You see it's a clean bed there. We have to have a clean um, weed-free bed where possible. Um, we've developed some technology of our own including the Wanda Dibber on the left hand side which makes little depressions all correctly spaced, ready for the sphagnum to go in. And we're also trialling a new form of um, plant husbandry here with some spray-on sphagnum. So essentially it's some um, strands of sphagnum suspended in a nutrient fluid. So it'll be interesting to see how that works. Just returning to the crops themselves, what are they useful for? Well, first of all, the typha. Um, the root itself is the tuber is very sweet and it can be used for cattle feed and human feed. In fact, if you look on the internet, you can find recipes. The body of the plant can be dried and used as um, biomass for fuel, for heating. It can also be compacted into an insulating material used in building uh, insulation. And it can also be used for things like food packaging. So wouldn't it be great if um, in the future all those plastic food containers disappeared and we had typhoid ones instead. Uh, the Phragmites, again, that can be used as um, a, a biofuel, compressed into briquettes. It can be compressed into a building material. It can even be um, blown into cavity walling for insulation. Glyceria fluitans is our food crop, also known as sweet grass or manna grass. Um, it was harvested from the wild in medieval Europe, and we can see there might be an application for it as a niche cereal. So think of porridge um, or muesli, so it can be used as a whole grain or it can be milled. East Anglia is the breadbasket of the UK, so we were keen to trial a food crop, hence this one. Uh, but the star of the show is really the sphagnum moss, um, the wonder crop. Um, perhaps most excitingly, it has huge potential as a horticultural growing medium. At the moment, when you buy compost from a plant centre, um, it is comprised of sphagnum moss, and probably that has come from a virgin peat bog somewhere in Indonesia or Canada or even Ireland. Um, so there's that whole domestic market, but also in the fens, this is where all the vegetables and salads are grown that you buy in the supermarket. They're all grown in little peat plugs. And wouldn't it be great if those big producers could call upon local farmers who are producing sphagnum as a crop, which they could then use as growing medium. It has lots of other properties as well. It's very absorbent. And in the 1970s, Johnson & Johnson took out patents for use of sphagnum as an absorbent in sanitary products, things like uh, nappies, sanitary towels, etc. It has, it's naturally antimicrobial um, and it can be even be used as an air purifier. I'll return to that. So within about 10 months, our little sphagnum uh, propagule should have grown into a closed canopy and um, the idea is that you leave it growing, you just harvest however many centimetres you want off the top and the rest will keep growing. Moving swiftly on, these are our uh, novel crops with various applications for food such as watercress. Then I've uh, frozen on Bethany's um, Wi-Fi. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, Great automated weather station, which is looking at um, uh, precipitation, humidity, wind speed. Um, it's also looking at um, atmospheric radiation. Uh, we're looking at the water uh, quality. We're looking at the uh, water table, the height of water within the peat. Uh, we're looking at, um, obviously, we're monitoring the wildlife us usage of the site and we're looking at crop growth and potential yield and other issues that 
come with the wet crop husbandry such as weed burdens etc. Perhaps most innovatively we're working with UKCH who are monitoring the um, carbon and methane fluxes from the pluticultural crops and from the peat itself. So essentially they're looking at the balance between the carbon dioxide which can be absorbed through photosynthesis and the carbon dioxide which is emitted from microorganisms in the soil and through the pluticultural plants themselves. They've developed this little chamber system for us. These chambers sit on the crops um, and they send data through um, real-time data through telemetry through to CEH who then do the data analysis. Um, we're working with the University of East London on the crop growth, so they're using their eyes on the bog methodology, which was developed for the IUCN. Um, they're also looking at how the peat is um, reacting in terms of the peat levels and how the water table is moving. Um, and also with um, UEL, we have an internship going that's looking at the use of sphagnum in architecture in green walls. Um, sphagnum has the ability to uh, filter out large particulates from the air and so UEL have a project going which is looking at how sphagnum could be used in busy traffic junctions in cities to improve the air quality. Uh, we're doing wildlife monitoring on site. Um, it's amazing how quickly the wildlife started moving in into our wet farming beds. Um, here are some pictures from Henry, our monitoring officer. A lot of stone chats up there. Flocks of snipe have started appearing. And um, we're also using our pluticultural trials to input into policy formation. Um, we're involved with the Lowland Agricultural Peat Task Force and more specifically the pluticulture subgroup. We've had groups from DEFRA out looking at what we're doing and so we have a direct input into policy formation. And what we're aiming at really is really a sharing of knowledge, a rippling out. Um, we've had many visits from farmers and growers and hope to have even more, COVID permitting. What we're interested in is sharing our knowledge, by no means telling fen farmers what to do, we would certainly never dream of doing that, but sharing what we learn and hoping they will be interested, inspired, see the commercial opportunities for themselves and adopt it in their own forms. And by that way, we'll achieve a ripple effect over a wider area, future-proofing farming, but also by creating a bigger matrix of wetland supporting our conservation network, um, our conservation net, our conservation wetlands within them. And here, this is just an interesting quote from a recent report from DEFRA, which um, highlights the possibilities inherent in wet farming to contribute towards delivering the UK's net zero emissions. So I'll just leave that on screen for a moment. Very conscious, there's a lot to tell you and uh, my time is ticking away. So um, apologies for running a little bit over. But I did want to say a few words about our Peatland Progress project. So uh, with this project, we will be scaling up our wet farming. We'll also be achieving one of the um, key visions for the Great Fen, which is to link together those two national nature reserves, Home Fen in the north, Wood Walton in the south, um, by creating a physical land link between both of them. And through Peatland Progress, we're about to acquire the orange land in the middle, which completes that physical link. Uh, but also we'll be upscaling our wet farming, which in itself will provide clean water for Wood Walton Fen, thus helping to protect Wood Walton Fen and protect its triple uh, SI status. And we'll be doing lots of other things in our project as well transforming the landscape, transforming farming, we hope, through our scaled up wet farming. Um, we'll also be um, exploring how the natural environment can help with uh, mental health issues. So we have a new collaboration with the Young People's Counselling Service, 
who use the natural environment as part of their therapeutic process, working with young people with mental health issues and their families. Um, and there's quite a lot of innovation in our project as well. Um, we'll be creating new partnerships between farming, research and policy making. And we're going to be building what we've called an, an inspiration hub, which will be um, a little tiny house built of polluted cultural materials so that we can show the end use applications of our polluted cultural crops when we grow out and about. We're going to be sharing our learning through site, re site visits and outreach. We're going to be running a programme called Science into Stories, which will help to translate that scientific theory into stories that all ages can enjoy and understand. We'll be contributing towards academic research. We plan a final year conference and we'll be building up our networks of policy makers, academics, farmers and growers. So lots to look forward to in the future. So that's it. Um, sorry for running over. Thank you very much for listening. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, it's just extraordinary, really. I think it's just an amazing project. Like um, the ambition and the uh, the scale of it is just incredible, really. And like the um, the, the, the all of these different aspects you were touching on in the end, uh, just it's just amazing. It's not it's not just about this one, you know, grow, like the issue growing crops on wetlands it's about so much more than that and it, and I think that's amazing and 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 taking this landscape approach as well you know I um like help with some conservation of some uh uh fens in Oxford um and something really always just comes up again and again is how sensitive these ecosystems are because it's not just about the 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 the, the area on the map marked as fen it's about it's affected by the hydrology of uh you know in 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 the areas around that as well and it's kind of you have to have this kind of very integrative um perspective of uh, on the landscape and so this kind of con connecting different nature reserves and really take managing uh it uh with that in mind i think is, is just amazing um and and kind of taking that landscape approach with people as well bringing other people in is is, is and 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 different um stakeholders and uh, uh, it's just fantastic um and yeah and and thank you as well for sharing about the different uh crops you're trying as well that i, I always find that fascinating um you know i i and it's it's interesting as well how all, all these crops are kind of have been used in the past i was reading um uh uh braiding sweetgrass um robin wall kimmerer is an author in in uh for, from America who, who who has a chapter on on kind of uh, the uses of of um of typha um and as well as a, another chapter she's written about the uses of sphagnum um by like um indigenous peoples in North America and it's these these kind of uses of them for for sanitary products for their absorbent qualities as um as well as the typha the, the the food um uh uh uses of that as well just like it's, it's kind of this ancient and uh, uh, like um the knowledge that is like and now kind of being used in these kind of uh uh, uh um applications in these in these polluted culture restoration projects as well as because i find that 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 very interesting um so thank you so much for that um that video um and i see there's some uh questions in the chat um uh and um so i'm going to turn to those now um uh so alison curtis asks um how are local schools and education centers uh, getting involved to raise hope and awareness okay so um hello everyone can you all hear me yep okay you, good um well do you mean in the Great Fen generally, or do you mean um, through our Waterworks project to begin with? Hello? Alison, feel, uh, Alison, feel free to unmute if, if you'd like to um, just um, respond to Kate um, rather than typing if you'd like. Or type if you. <laughs> Okay, got it. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was particularly interested locally with that particular project. 
uh, with, with the waterworks project uh, with yeah. the waterworks project yes, yes. Yeah. yeah you you better uh, mute yeah. me again cuz i've got noisy dogs okay <laughs> okay <laughs> okay right um yeah um the honest answer is not as much as we would have wished because of covid so um we started the site works last um we started them around about spring 2020 we had to stop because of covid and the first lockdown and all the rest of it we weren't allowed to have any volunteer visits site visits we weren't allowed to have any school visits etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so that situation has not really fully resolved itself because schools still aren't largely doing visits out of school um However, we, um, you know, we, we're always going to be there. So, <laughs> so hopefully when the situation improves, um, but speaking of the Great Fen generally, uh, we have another wing of the Great Fen, which is the wildlife and community section, which is based at our countryside centre in Ramsey Heights. And I didn't really talk about their work because, you know, I could talk about the Great Fen all evening and we're not here all evening. So, um, and they do a huge amount of work in school, so curriculum based work, they do preschool work with a little bugs club, they do family activities in the school holidays. We do outreach activities to um, people with cognitive impairments, such as dementia sufferers or stroke victims or whatever. So there's a sort of huge supportive program that gets the um, message of the great fen out to as many audiences as, as we wish as we as we hope we, we can reach. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, another uh, question from uh, Bethany was, um, uh, I was wondering a little about what the neighbouring farmers thought. Um, uh, I heard from some people in projects in the Netherlands that uh, one of the major obstacles they faced was working with neighbouring farmers and making sure they were okay with the rewetting. Okay, so um, thinking about the Great Fen generally, which is quite a controversial vision, if you like, because we're taking land out of arable re production, arable reversion, creating wetland. So I can honestly say there's a whole spectrum of response to this, ranging from very supportive to very unsupportive. Um, the very supportive farmers, so for example, um, if we're taking, if we're buying land or if we're um, buying out the reversion of a tenancy, we always try and involve the outgoing farmer with the creation of the new wetland. So offering contracts for um, um, seeding, putting the new sward in or from hay contracting or whatever. Um, on the back of that, we've had a couple of farmers who have created whole new farm businesses and farm income streams because of their new contact with the Great Fen. So um, one in particular I'm thinking of who um, has a hay business um, we also, we're also able to support um, small rural enterprises through the conservation management, so through grazing, because we have a lot of transitional grassland, it has to be grazed, and so we've now got six or seven grazing businesses, so people who bring their animals into the Great Fen, we have a system of summer grazing licences and winter grazing licences, and very often these are people without family farms, but who want to get into farming want to get into agriculture, so very often young people. Um, and then on the other end of the scale, we've got farmers who simply want to carry on farming in the traditional Arab, dry arable way. And um, even within our, within our Great Fen vision area, we've got land which we own the freehold of, but the leasehold is still held by three generational um, AHA tenancies, so Agricultural Holding Act tenancies. And if those farmers want to carry on arable farming, then we can do nothing to prevent that. And that's one of the great challenges of the Great Fen because we don't have complete hydrological control. So we can't start wetting up the land willy nilly. We have to make sure that their dry farming areas are protected and they can carry on. So it's a question of managing these relationships and managing the expectations. Um, one thing that we have felt which um, has been very helpful and this really sort of probably hints back to something Alison was thinking of when she asked that question um, we've also used heritage a lot and the stories of the landscape and stories of how people lived to connect with local um, communities and you know local families local farmers local communities 
And that's been a huge asset to us. So people who aren't interested, aren't remotely interested in nature or nature conservation, but who are interested in you know, their family and their family's place on the land and the heritage and history and the stories, it's a way of engaging with them. And a really good example of that was in 2015, where we dug up a Spitfire. <laughs> so in uh, 1940, a Spitfire came down just east of Home Fen into land that now belongs to the Great Fen. And we were re-wetting this area. And uh, we did a massive project to dig the Spitfire up, basically. And uh, it was a huge project involving the Ministry of Defence and a group called Operation Nightingale, which is a group of veterans who use archaeology as a therapeutic process. Uh, we had Cranfield University involved, all sorts of people were involved, local schools. We did a big thing with the local school in Home Village. And it resulted um, in a, in a week-long dig, um, including some very moving elements of that with memorial services and all sorts of things. Um, and it created a huge amount of media coverage, the most the Wildlife Trust has ever had for anything it's ever done. And it connected with, you know, a really wide community. And we, we now have a permanent memorial on site. And every year the local community comes and does a, you know, memorial service on the 11th of November. So that's just one good example of how heritage can help link us into those local communities. Thank you so much. I was, yeah, well, I hadn't heard that story before. It's really, um, really moving and and really fascinating. Um, we, we've we've got a film all about the Spitfire, by the way. You can... Oh, okay, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll definitely yeah. check that out. Yeah, it's won prizes. The film that is. It's oh wow! <laughs> won various film prizes. But yeah, yeah, no, you're so right about that power of like her using heritage to kind of connect people and stuff. I mean, and mm. and peatlands, we we talk about heritage and peatlands and archaeology and 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 this um, uh, a lot. Um, but uh, having some so uh, so recent in some ways for 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 uh, peatland heritage, you know, when we're thinking about thousands of years old bog bodies and things like that, it's, it's very interesting to hear mm. about a bit far. Uh, what I probably should just add, Jamie, is that mm. thinking about the Waterworks project, as I said on the slide, what we're hoping to have is a sort of ripple effect to, mm. um, you know, spread that knowledge, spread that interest amongst farmers uh, and growers and producers. And, um, you know, we're not saying this is the only answer to climate change. We're not saying that this, this is the solution for, for farmers to adopt. But what we're saying is that, you know, if, you've, if you're a small fen farmer, for example, and you've got an area of your farm that's always lain wet and you've never been able to do much with it and perhaps want to try something with it that might produce a bit of an income for you, this could be an answer. And for some of the bigger growers um, who were, you know, quite a long way down regenerative, regenerative agriculture road anyway, this may be opportunities for them as well. So, you know, we, we, what we really want is to have some early adopters who then spread the word amongst their own peers, because the best way for farmers to and, you know, landowners to to adopt new ideas is not us telling them <laughs> or showing them, but through their peer, through peer group transmission. And, and do you uh, have you. Um seen some early adopters or some some interest from 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 some groups around yeah yeah we have i mean we've we've had groups out we've had nfu groups and cla groups out and we've had individual farmers out as well okay. um we know at least one that's seriously considering um wet farming that's very encouraging that's good to hear um and, and of course you know we've been limited by covid as to who <laughs> who can come and when but, yeah. um, you know, the, the site will always, as long as we can fund it, the site will mm -hmm. always be there as a resource uh, for people to come and visit and explore new ideas with us. Brilliant. Um, so I think, I think that pretty much answers Kate's question as well. But, um, but just to add, she, she highlights that it's so significant that 52% of agricultural CO2 comes from lowland peat farming, if I understood this right um i'm not sure that this is widely known at all um so i just thought i'd mention that comment because i i, I found that um yeah um a good uh, statistic and yeah and very interesting um and yeah i didn't i didn't know that 
Um, Frankie had a had a question, um, and this is the final question I think um, is uh, the picture which you showed where the planting was happening. Um, so I think there's the waterworks. It um, looked like there was kind of dry sand around it. Um, I don't know whether that was something, whether that was stubble or or something. But um, I wonder, yeah, whether maybe you could talk a bit more about just how that site was constructed and um, and what. Uh, because it kind of it was that kind of relates to a question I was sort of thinking was that you know this often talk about like restoration or or what have you but it's it's um it's a different I suppose ecosystem in some ways um to what especially with the waterworks and than than um than it was a hundred like hundreds of years ago before it was drained I, I suppose and I was just mm -hmm. yeah so I, I wonder whether you could speak about that for a, a moment just like how maybe how that was. Um, um landscapes and things and, and kind of maybe what what that um implications are for that for that ecosystem i suppose um i'm not sure which picture you mean um because there's no sand in, <laughs> no sand involved um so the the pluticultural beds that that site is within um, an area of the great fen a particular farm within the great fen which has been under arable reversion since i think um and around about 2012, I think. So it's mostly down to, to grassland at the moment. Um, so um, on the other hand, there's another picture in the presentation of the sphagnum planting, which shows um, people on their knees planting the sphagnum and behind them, there's a sort of silvery covering to the, to the ground. So it might be that one you're thinking of. Um, that is a that is a membrane that we've put over the peat to prevent the ingress of seeds. So as I mentioned, we like to plant into a clean bed, and um, obviously peat is full of um, massive agricultural seed bank and seeds blow in all the time. So it's it's a permeable uh, membrane that we'll just have over the top until the sphagnum forms until the sphagnum takes off and eventually forms a cl closed canopy. So. You may have been thinking of that. Um, are you asking me about what the process is, Jamie, of, of how you change arable land into wetland? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, I, I know yeah. that's a big question, but if you if there's yeah, a, no, I can talk about. I mean, that. just just what you said about that that about the seed the agricultural seed bank. I found that, that that's very interesting, some and challenge to contend with. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so typically we'll take land that's come out of arable production so it's last crop maybe something like onions for instance um, and then what we try and do is to um, establish a sward and previously we used to plow but now we try and drill into whatever's been left us because we don't want to release carbon through tillage through the plowing um, and the point of creating a sward is to uh, stabilize the peat because the top few centimetres of peat will be very degraded. And if we just sloshed water on them, it would be like porridge and we won't be able to do anything with it. Um, and also to establish a sward, which will help repress the seed bank as well. Um, we'll start work on the um, agricultural ditches. So typically the um, pre-restoration ditches will be very steep sided like that. And we will reprofile them so that we have a, a more um, shallow profile so that we get some edge and we get um, a free board as, as the water moves, moves up and down. Um, once the sward is established, uh, we'll take a hay crop. And the point of that is that um, the hay will help to take agricultural nutrients out of the soil because this is land that's been um, had, you know, agri chemicals on for decades, probably. Um, and, and the hay can do that. We'll then probably follow on with some aftermath grazing by the small grazers, the sheep, um, and then eventually move on to um, cattle grazing. And this is a very extensive system, so probably no more than one beast per hectare. Um, all this time we'll be working on the water table, gradually raising the water table, putting in water control structures so that we begin to have more control over the water management. Um, the large graziers will create a sort of micro topography through poaching the ground with their feet and through wallow holes. So we get little pits and pools and hollows for breeding waders or whatever. And so through that sort of gradual transitional system, we can start to create wetland. So that's one method. 
Um, another method we have is much more interventionist. And there are some areas of the Great Fen where we have sculpted the landscape. So that picture I showed you of Kester's docking with all those sinuous channels, you know, that, that was created through diggers being on site and very carefully working out the levels and uh, creating that. And in other areas, we've done quite big um, sculpting works, if you like, creating new mirrors, creating new drainage channels, doing away completely with the old rectilinear field drain system, putting in more cursive drains, putting in water control structures. So really giving nature a, a good kickstart through heavy engineering, if you like. Um, we can only do that when we've got the money to do that. So our default position is to create grassland and have that more gradual approach, which I first uh, mentioned to you. And all the way through this, we'll be monitoring, doing the ecological monitoring as well as the um, abiotic monitoring as well, um, to make sure that we measure initially baselines and then the impact on the landscape, on the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that, that's, yeah, thank you so much um, for that answer. Because um, uh, that was something else that uh, struck me when, in, during your presentation that this, this emphasis on monitoring as you're doing this, I think mm -hmm. is just, just so, uh, such a good <laughs> foresight, um, cause, you know, because this is a, a, it can, the the lessons of the great fen can can be then applied to 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 other um to other projects as well um and uh and we can really understand this kind of process um even better so yeah and it's it's um i found that really, thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. um my, uh, my colleague, Henry Stanier, who's our um, ecology officer, does a fantastic talk all about the monitoring and oh, wow. um, all about drone monitoring as well. So you know, uh, if you yes. ever want another great fence speaker, I'm sure Henry would be uh, you know, pleased to do it. Oh yeah, thank you yeah. for the for the tip off. <laughs> I hope Henry doesn't mind being volunteered. <laughs> he doesn't. He he does lots of talks, and he's got oh, the most brilliant. fantastic slides and animations. He's much more um, accomplished yeah. than I am with um, PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, I, I thought you were very, very accomplished and that was because of a fantastic presentation um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and just a, a, a great, uh, a, a great talk and, um, and I feel like there's, from what you've hinted at, there's even more really um, to kind of find out about. Um, so mm -hmm. I, um, I uh, encourage people to kind of look at the your, the website and stuff, which I've, I've had a good browse of before. And there's a, there's some videos on YouTube, I believe, as well. And um, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. So we can really yeah. And that. and if any of you are local to the fens and want to come and plant some sphagnum, then we'll be doing it all spring. So. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'll be able to get there in the spring. I think. Um, mm. uh, it's a uh, yeah. I would, I'd love to come and and, and visit. Okay, Brilliant. Good. Well. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, I think we'll move on to, to our next speaker now. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce Robert um, Cordwell. Um, uh, so Robert uh, is the chair of uh, DEFRA's Lowland Agricultural Peat Task Force, which was mentioned in Kate's presentation, um, and uh, as well as being the chair of the Association of Drainage Authorities. Um, he's got over 40 years experience in arable and horticultural farming. Uh, so the task force is looking at more sustainable peatland management options, uh, including innovative ways to manage water levels, the effects on flood risk, uh, farming profits and food production, uh, as well as long term opportunities for polluting culture. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll pass over to uh, Robert. Thank you. Robert. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, uh, some brilliant uh, presentations. I think I uh, really enjoyed the uh, video and Kate's presentation. Uh, I have had the opportunity to visit the Great Fen for one of my trips around the country. So uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I'll just explain to the start for anybody who isn't aware of what um, and how, how the task force came about, uh, what it is and, and why am I chairman? Um, so about two years ago, DEFRA, asked for expressions of interest um, around uh, the country of people involved in peat management, uh, lowland peat management. Uh, and uh, so there are expressions of interest from uh, our own organization, Association of Drainage Authorities, but also from the NFU, 
CLA, uh, CEH um, that um, Kate's mentioned there, um, RSPB. So lots of people who really were keen to interest, as well as some individual uh, growers and farmers. So um, at the beginning of this year, the minister, so Minister Rebecca Powell um, asked me to chair the task force and uh, the group was formed as a national task force. And our remit was to create uh, four regional groups. And I'll go on, just explain a little bit about what they are. And the polluticulture group that Kate's mentioned about that. So there are, there are five effective subgroups that feed in to the national task force. And our remit is to uh, report back two ministers uh, next summer. So presumably before the recess next summer. And that will be um, the end of the national task force. Uh, so what am I gonna be reporting back on? I'm reporting back basically to the minister on uh, how we can take um, agriculture forward to on, that is, on peatlands that is more sustainable than it has been. I think it's been clear from the presentations you've already seen about the problems that we've got with emissions. Peat is one of the, well, it is the biggest source, more, more carbon stored in peatland than it is in the, in the rainforest. Hugely important on an international scale. The ministers also made it really clear to me, this is not about displacement. So what do I mean by that? This isn't about uh, moving production outside the UK and then just growing it somewhere else on Peter elsewhere and saying, well, that solved the problem because clearly that hasn't. And, it, and, and I will explain a bit of what uh, that we're actually seeing some of those issues uh, actually starting to play out. So we are working with international partners we have links as an organization with the water boards in the Netherlands, and we're working with them to actually look at what they're doing. Uh, I know there's work been going on uh, in Indonesia, New Zealand. So it is happening all over the world. And I think there are some actual actions in the, in the States as well. So this is an international issue. Are we behind? No, I don't think we are. I think we're actually um, really getting to grips with this, but time is ticking. Um, you know, the emissions, climate change is happening now. Uh, let there be no doubt about that. Um, communities are suffering. We've seen the horrendous um, tornadoes in the States. We're seeing extreme events in this country, whether it be flooding, but also droughts. And I will talk about water resources quite a bit, Jamie, because it is going to be one of the biggest issues. And it's one of the things that actually keeps me awake at night is worrying about actually water resources, because what has been clear, um, and we looked at um, how we have developed uh, the evidence, the evidence is, and I think Kate made it really clear in her presentation, it's about managing those water levels and raising that water table. But you needed the resource to do that on a, on a large scale, for instance, across the fens, um, you, would need, you would need a vast amount of water. And in a dry time, which we're likely to get, we only need a dry winter and public water supply will be compromised. Uh, they're already talking about having to put in desalination plants to actually um, supply enough water for the public supply, two new big reservoirs being talked about in the eastern part of England. So real, real stress on water resources. So the, the regional groups, we've got uh, an eastern group, which comprises of uh, representatives from the Fens, uh, but also from Broadland. So Broadland's just as important, uh, some really important Fenland uh, some important peatland there, uh, and they are led by a local farmer. So I, I've called them local champions. So 
local farmers who are really enthusiastic about this and those they are leading those regional groups. We have a group down in the southwest. Uh, majority of the peatland down there is on the Somerset levels, very different to the Fens in terms of uh, very little arable. Majority of it is grassland, traditional low input grassland. Um, I think everybody will be aware of the flood risk issues there. 13, 14, they had horrendous floods. Um, even the prime minister was called down there to actually um, make promises and about it would never happen again, which I, I can't understand why politicians ever make those, those sort of comments. But um, uh, anyway, uh, big investment in, in there. Uh, really good uh, interaction. Uh, I would say that they're, they're certainly not backward at, um, at um, saying what they think down there. Uh, but some really interesting things going down there. And yet again, I've uh, got a local farmer who's really enthusiastic about this, looking at those issues and some really great stuff going on down there. And at the last regional meeting in the Southwest, uh, we heard about the Farm, Farming, Wildlife and Advisory Group is leading a partnership project. And I really want to emphasize this in my piece, it is about building partnerships. That's what I've tasked all of my regional champions to do, is to build partnerships to make sure that they are absolutely delivering um, across there. And I wanted a bottom-up approach. So in the Southwest, they're building that partnership. They're going out and looking at trial areas right across uh, the levels in different malls. I mean, one of the malls is called Sedgemoor, so you can, you know, you can tell what these what these areas used to be and what they would revert to um, if poss if nature was allowed to just take its place. Uh, but clearly, there are communities down there. Um, there are people who live down there, but there are also, you know, communities who farmed for generations down there. Uh, a lot of dairy farming and a lot of uh, extensive bee farming. So they're looking at different water level management. Um, it is quite a wet area and their flood risk management is just as important as managing their, um, managing their, their resources in terms of that. Uh, our next group is in the Northwest where we've got really, really enthusiastic lady, first generation, tenant farmer, uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, a great find. And she's really uh, leading the farming community. Uh, she's also involved with the NFU uh, and she's, she's absolutely fantastically enthusiastic. I was over there looking at the carbon farming trial that the Wildlife, Lancashire Wildlife Trust are, are doing there. And, and she's led farmers groups there to look at the commercial opportunities that could be there from farming uh, in, in wetter areas. But yet again, even in the Northwest, they found that actually water resources and having enough water to establish the sphagnum beds was really the problem. And they, they, that is something that uh, we really need to work on and how we can do that, whether we can find water resources without taking away from public supply. Uh, certainly don't want to be using um, the public supply of water, but there's plenty of water which we do normally either sluice or pump out to sea, uh, which we could actually use. And I think Kate talked about it, about polishing it through, cleaning it up through uh, these beds. And I've seen Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust do, so do some work on that. But there's some really good stuff that actually happening there. And I think the farmers were so enthusiastic there when they looked at the commercial opportunities. And they're particularly looking at um, peat um, replacement. So looking at uh, using sphagnum as a peat replacement. And to me, that, that's um, a great sort of circular economy, if you like, about not just um, restoring the peat, uh, and preventing emissions, but also preventing extraction, which is still happening today. 
I mean, it's unbelievable that actually people are still, and last week, um, there was a debate in the uh, Republic of Ireland um, Parliament about actually reissuing licenses for, pe for commercial peat extraction. I'm not talking about which they have a very traditional um, uh, peat sort of uh, people where people uh, for burning in houses where they can uh, take blocks out and that's been managed because they've had a They've had a, um, a peat uh, committee for a long time, so they were well ahead of the game. But there's been pressure from politicians to actually restore that for economic gain. Let's be clear about that. Um, that will be a really backward step, and, and I hope that that doesn't happen, and that they they really look at the bigger picture and think, crikey, you know, we we mustn't do this. Uh, I know that is still some happening uh, and there has been some issues about use of uh, peat in the horticultural sector, but we still have, we still got garden centres that are selling uh, peat based compost. There is no, it's been on a voluntary basis and to my mind, um, or that is not part of my remit but I will be clear, making it clear to ministers that if they want farmers and growers to really be enthused about this, they have to show leadership on that and actually make sure that uh, they really are um, intending to, to um, stop extraction of peat, because that will then drive the opportunities for market uh, replacement of that. Uh, and I think that's something that um, I'm quite passionate about, that we need to do. So our next group I want to talk about is in the Northwest, um, Northeast, sorry. So the Northeast, we've got a group and we're looking from uh, around the Humber. So we've got the Humber head levels, Isle of Axo, uh, led by a farmer who is, he's um, had a government grant to do some fantastic work on, um, he's a horticultural, organic horticultural producer, He's moving all of his production inside. Uh, he's turning his land or a portion of his land to uh, willow, which of course can withstand high water table, uh, using the willow through a pyrolysis uh, system to gain energy to, uh, uh, to drive his horticultural production. So all of the energy for the horticultural inside horticultural production will come from that. And the resulting carbon will then be um, buried back in the land. So uh, it's effectively a reverse coal um, situation. Uh, that's had a government grant, has all of these projects. And I think Kate pointed out, at the moment, this is all, all of the projects I've looked at have been uh, sort of very, um, hand planting, very labour intensive. Um, and it is very much a bit of chicken and egg to actually get it. Uh, you need the market to encourage people to invest in mechanising this and scaling it up. But all of those, there, is, there, is our, there are opportunities out there. And I'm really encouraged by the enthusiasm of farmers and growers themselves to actually take the take the um, cudgel up and really go with this. So uh, coming back to our Eastern group, led again by one of our local farmers, um, and they formed a uh, farmers group called Fenland Soil. Uh, that's recently been uh, formed, uh, and they're looking to um, gain members to that. So there's be a small, small payment from that to, to look at that working with uh, Chris Evans from CEH to actually um, look at the evidence and try and get more flux towers, more evidence on um, different management techniques, because um, what we want to do, and polluted culture is a great option for those wetter corners and those wetter fields, which we all have as farmers. We all have fields that we've struggled to uh, really get decent production on and they, that's a great option for that but for the vast majority I want to see um, techniques of farming 
um, and you can call it regenerative agriculture. There are lots of conservation agriculture. I think there's lots of different um, terminology, but there are techniques of farming which are coming through, but we need to develop a uh, effectively a peatland uh, uh, code and a peatland technique of farming, which will really reduce those emissions and reduce those losses. I think as um, Kate said there, um, you know, tillage is going to be key to this. Um, there are lots of techniques now of uh, reduced tillage uh, and nil till, so no tillage of the soil at all. Uh, that certainly is helping. Is it making the difference that we want? Um, some farmers have, have got evidence of um, that they have increased their their organic matter, so their carbon stored in the soil. From most of the fields, let's be clear about this, after generations of tillage, uh, most of it is what is known called skirt soil or uh, wasted fen, so that most of the carbon has gone. But the evidence from CEH is that they are still emitting carbon. So that is our area of concentration, if you like. I definitely want to um, really protect the deep peats. And I think those are our most valuable stores. Uh, and we should, we should be making sure they're protected. But I think the, the areas that the really the biggest gain is sequestering carbon into these wasted peat soils because they've effectively nearly emptied the bucket and you could really look at actually um, doing that. It will involve water management on a very large scale. So we're talking about managing catchments through internal drainage boards and the environment agency, um, not compromising flood risk, but we will be looking at managing catchments to raise the water tables. There are farmers who have done this on a farm scale, on a whole farm scale, um, but very, very intensive management. They've laser leveled every field and they're managing every field uh, on, a, on a separate basis. That isn't practical or economic uh, for most farmers. Uh, so it is going to be something that we are going to have to look at that but I am really convinced that there are opportunities there. We had a task force visit, so the National Task Force visited uh, Broadland um, a few weeks ago, and um, really interesting day there where we actually were looking at some of the work that was going on. 90% of the thatching reed in this country is imported from China. And that is, I mean, when I told the minister that, she was completely, blown away and couldn't, absolutely ridiculous. Most of the thatching uh, operation in um, Norfolk is still on a very much hand harvested uh, cottage scale. We need to scale that up with mechanized harvesting. Which you, the equipment is available to do that. And uh, the Broadland Broads Authority are um, working with the local farmer there, our local farmer champion, um, who is also chair, chairman of the local drainage board, uh, to actually looking at a trial, reed planting trial, but yet again, hand planted. So actually it's getting the scale so that these are competitive um, and economic to do for people to do that. And I, but, there, but there are market is that it's clearly there. Uh, and I think that um, I'm really enthused about the opportunities out there for people um, and grasping that. I think Kate's absolutely right. It's peer pressure and people, people looking over the fence and saying, oh, crikey, he's doing rather well out of this. And my pitch to government will be about getting us through that move from the hand planting, um, even at a field scale, up to really scaling that up and getting uh, the equipment right, because of course you would need, uh, you, most of farm equipment is um, 
basically been evolved from um, uh, American style, um, large open plains on dry land. What we really need to do is to, is to look back to smaller, uh, lighter equipment that can actually work some of these wetter soils. Um, I, I don't, it's not beyond um, the ability of engineers to do that in any means, but you know that it, it does take time and we have to prove that it is commercially viable because I, I, want, to, I want to have this on a basis that it doesn't need endless government support uh, and we're constantly going with a begging bowl to government, but government do have to actually pump prime the system and make it so that there is um, a real opportunity. So by next summer, um, I will be um, along with the DEFRA team and the task force. Um, and at the moment, we're at a sort of stage of, <coughs> excuse me, um, draft reports. So that report will go in. The National Task Force will then uh, cease to exist. What I'm hoping is that the regional groups, um, as I've explained in the East, they've set up their own um, Fenland soil group. And the regional groups will effectively evolve into their own um, systems. And that seems to be happening already and starting to really uh, happen and, and happen without me having to push it, but that's certainly what our ask is, that those groups then evolve into something that has their own governance, is self-sustaining, but really starts to. And from a start when I think a lot of farmers all around the country are pretty suspicious uh, and we're not exactly uh, supportive, uh, there's a real feeling uh, of enthusiasm and, and hope for the future. And I, I think that is absolutely great. And I'm more than happy to you know, have a debate about this in time that you've got left, Jamie. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, yeah, and no, that was a uh, like really uh, uh, interesting presentation like on, on uh, I, I've kind of read about the Lowland uh, Task Force and um, been quite interested in it, but I um, haven't really uh, appreciated this, uh, this kind of structuring of like how it's, you know, these regional groups. And I think that's such an exciting um, plan for this, you know, it doesn't end after the, after the report has been filed. Um, uh, so yeah, so thank you so much for that. Um, we have a, uh, Bethany asked a question like about the because and this is something that I I um, uh, thought as well when you were speaking. This is a question about water levels, um, about the water shortage is actually you know as a as a and water managing water as a resource as a limited resource um, in the future. Because um, she wondered like whether because she said I presume long term long term well peatlands contribute towards more available water and help conserve water um peat, like um kind of restored uh peatlands in that um and then then just additionally to that how important are water boards as a partner in in all of this well um yeah the the the, the water boards so we work with the water companies the environment agency and the internal drainage board so all of those together are hugely important in this what, um, uh, and I had an opportunity a um, month or so ago to actually go and have a look at um, something uh, really innovative project called the Felixstowe Hydrocycle, which is taking water which would be not suitable for public consumption, but would normally be just pumped out to sea. And rather than doing that, it's taken back to refill um, local farm reservoirs, but also recharging aquifers. And I think there's some real opportunity there because um, although when um, the peat will, re-wetting the peat to actually get it started requires a large amount of water, I'm not um, altogether sure that that water will necessarily uh, it's certainly not going to solve our um, public water supply uh, issues, 
But what we need to do is to be thinking much more holistically. And Water Resources East, there's five regional uh, water resource um, groups. Water Resource East is one of those, but it's looking at a much more holistic issues in trying to, and we're working with them. We had a presentation from them at the last task force on how they're looking in a more holistic way on an actually water resource. And we do think that um, actually peat management is going to be a significant user of water, but it isn't hopefully not drawing on those same, uh, ish, same resources that public supply would be. So what we need to do is to try and develop a mosaic of uh, different resources so that we have got that. Because of course, if you're trying to grow most of these crops, the sphagnum and things like that, different varieties of sphagnum um, can respond, but they do require a wet environment. And if we get a dry summer, uh, follow, a dry winter, sorry, but followed by a dry summer, uh, you know, it'd be, there'll be a problem. Most drains, most of the farm drains will be, will be um, dry uh, and rivers are already over abstracted from an environmental point of view. So environment agencies looking to reduce abstraction and that does worry me that we need to actually make sure we've got the resource. And, I, you know, we're looking in the east at over 10 megalitres a day in terms of um, available need. Thank you for that answer, Robert. Um, uh, I, I, I had a, qu uh, a question, I was wondering, in, in, with the um, Lone Agricultural Peat Task Force, um, are there opportunities for, um, for groups like Repeat or for the public or the, um, to kind of have uh, some sort of involvement in, in that kind of process? Yeah, what we've said is that um, the National Task Force, because we've got a limited time, um, we took the decision not to extend uh, the groups on the National Task Force because um, otherwise I'd have ended up um, with um, a conference every time rather than uh, a small committee to write a report. So we're not extending that, but of course, we do get feedback in from lots of other groups, but the regional groups, we, their specific role is to engage with all sorts of communities and results. So actually it's at the regional level, we're looking to, and local, because I wanted a bottom up approach. So of course we're involved with, and as Kate mentioned, that they're involved in part of that. Other wildlife trusts are involved in their local groups, but it doesn't mean to say that we don't take those because it's a bottom-up approach. Of course, they do feed in to our thinking at a national group. So yes, but rather at a, at a, at a local or a regional level than at the national level. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah, and, ob and obviously that's uh, in many ways more effective, I suppose, at feeding in at that kind of more devolved level as well. That's where, that's where, the, that's where the action's going to be. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. it will continue on beyond next summer. Agreed. Definitely. Uh, that's 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 great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, Bethany says, yes, bottom yeah, up. Bottom up. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, don't, I don't think about it. Yeah, absolutely, Bethany. Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to finish with um, one last um, question, I think, um, before I close with some uh, final uh, comments. Um, uh, is uh, Kate uh, asked um, uh, or mentioned said a uh, uh, really interesting point about the agricultural technology? Thank you. Uh, and uh, rather than trying to create prairies with inappropriate machines, what better technologies would be helpful? Um, in that, I think you, you mentioned these kind of smaller scale um, machines or, or, or technologies. Perhaps you could mention just a couple of it, uh, uh, of those before, uh, just to close yeah, off. Yeah, it's a matter of um, you know clearly it's uh, I, over my lifetime farming. You know we've moved from um, quite small machines to bigger and heavier and. Um, more American style equipment, if you like. Um, actually, uh, it's not about turning back and saying, well, let's just go back and have all have 
sort of small, um, you know, but really interesting stuff. Lincoln University is doing some quite interesting work on robotics. If you have a robotic machine, either planting or satellite controlled, um, actually you don't need the weight. You don't, and they're already doing some work on that where actually, and if you've got a lightweight robot doing the work and on there, whether it be planting or whether it be harvesting, uh, you, you actually, you can really reduce the amount of traffic and weight mm -hmm. that we're doing on that. Um, so, you know, there are some really good options. What we tended to do as farmers is to think, well, it doesn't matter because we'll just fit a bigger tire, but you're still putting that weight mm. across the land. Uh, I think we're all starting to understand now that that is pretty damaging to our soils, whether it be peat or, or, or mineral soils. So actually, um, I think the whole agricultural industry is moving in that direction. But there is certainly, you know, this could be the kickstart for a robotic revolution, if you like. Thank you so much. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, and yeah, and I suppose it's it's uh, balancing that kind of like that use of um, of um, technology and and um, novel kind of like um, uh, mechanics and things with that all the kind of uh, community engagement and involving people as well. That kind of like balance of of those of those two things is, I think, a, a really um, uh, interesting challenge with with. Um, with uh wetland farming but also farming um at large i suppose um and yeah bethany you said really interesting to see uh police culture bringing together heritage and technology and, and, and the future of the past i think is, is is a great point um so i'll say i'll say um thank you very much now uh robert for for um for speaking um and, and sharing uh, all about the Task force as it was, yeah, very, very interesting um, presentation. I thought uh, complimented uh, Kate um, uh, superbly, and um, and uh, now I'm just going to sort of uh, close off and say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, uh, very able to yes. Um, so the so the talks will be uh, per, uh, this this. Um, episode in particular, as well as all our previous um, uh, webinars uh, are available on our YouTube channel um, and it'll be up there in coming week or two as um, when, when we got time to put it up, um, including the video we made before. Uh, and so, yeah, and, and on that, just, you know, this is the last episode, uh, last edition of, uh, of the UK anthology series. Um, and um, I just want to thank everyone for uh, who's been involved with that um, uh, and who's attended them. And, you know, so we, we've covered a whole range of topics, um, including let me just go through them really quickly. Uh, we began with peatlands and the UK just uh, at large uh, to introduce the, the, the series. Um, our February, uh, oh, sorry, our April um, episode was peatlands and forestry. We went on to peatlands and climate injustice. Um, uh, we then talked about peatlands and wind turbines, peatlands and land ownership, peatlands and gardening, peatlands and COP26, peatlands and time, and finally, peatlands and agriculture. And this is all sort of in the UK context as a focal point, but obviously talking um, uh, uh, about um, global issues um, within that. And so I just think that's just... Um, uh, a great range of, of issues and topics that we've covered and um, uh, and I hope uh, people will uh, go and check those out uh, on our YouTube channel um, and rewatch them um, and just kind of uh, as well uh, just to mention that this is not we don't we can try to see this not as the end of the UK anthology um, uh, although it's the last uh, uh, edition um, but it, we want um, this to serve as a resource and, and a continuing process and conversation uh, into uh, next year because we were really thinking about this kind of framing um, this this series with uh, COP26 in November this year um, and then next year in November is the World Congress of uh, Soil um, Science and um, kind of having these two bookended kind of things and really thinking about how we can continue this um, this uh this this um project uh into the next year and you know and if, if anyone's watching that has an ideas for that and wants to be involved 
as always, um, please get in touch with us. We love, as we've learned uh, uh, this evening uh, from, from the speakers, the importance of partnerships. And that's something we, we're really um, uh, 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 all about uh, at Repeat as well, collaborations um, and learning from each other. And so, so yeah, if, if anyone um, wants to uh, work with us and, and, and talk to us, then please um, get in touch. Um, uh so yeah and so um yes that, and uh, that's all i wanted to say um and uh i just want to thank everyone once again and uh, everyone at repeat who's put on so much um hard work into this series as well as all of our uh, participants and and attendees so um yes thank you so much everyone for for coming <laughs> thanks everyone have a good evening thank you, thank you. bye thank you Wrong, bye.